Okay, everyone. I see participants are coming into the plenary session. We have a very, very, very packed plenary and very popular, hopefully. We are now talking about, we'll be talking about for the next hour, actually, some more hours actually in, in parallel sessions, um, the topic of the conference, designing for data use. We have been working on data use for our DHS2 for some years. It's very high up on our strategy. However, we also this year are focusing more of how can we enabling the design for data use to incentivize data use. So that will be the topic for this one hour plenary. I'm very, very happy to announce our, our WHO colleague uh, to, to open this um, plenary on designing for data use, Dr. Somnath Chatterjee. He is, he is the director of deputy of data, of the Department of Data and Analytics, and he has served in WHO for over 20 years, working on measurement, analysis, and surveys. So it will be very, very good to start off this one hour session going into depth into designing for data use. So over to you, Somnat. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Kristen, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my apologies that uh, I cannot turn my uh, video on, but uh, so you're missing my beautiful face. But nonetheless, uh, to uh, get right uh, on to what we're going to talk about now is really, I mean, you know, while I uh, direct the Department of Data and Analytics here at uh, WHO, of course, you know, data is not for the sake of data. Ultimately, we want uh, the data, no matter how it is generated, to actually be used uh, to deliver uh, the impact we want on population health. So, so I think that really is going to be our focus today, to talk about how to use data to measure impact and look at the profile of country health status. Can I have the next slide, please? So, the, our division of data analytics and delivery for impact really is created uh, you know, during WHO's transformation to have this relentless focus on results, obviously in collaboration with all of you, our countries, our partners, in supporting the entire data ecosystem right from generation to use and to ensure that the data we generate is timely, reliable, and actionable, so that it can inform the actions we take to deliver the impact uh, to the people around the world. Can I have the next slide, please? So what have we done this far? We have just produced, like many of you would have seen, uh, you know, the technical package for data and health information systems in countries, focusing whether it's on surveys or surveillance systems, counting populations in terms of registration and vital statistics, optimizing the data that comes from uh, health services, that is health facilities, whether it's the health facility assessments or routine health information systems, which is really our focus today. And then, uh, make sure that countries actually have national review plans uh, to enable the use of this data to deliver impact. We have just released our first assessment uh, of the status of the capacity of data and health information systems in countries. We also have released our most recent version of our annual report, the World Health Statistics, that sort of tracks the progress towards health and health-related uh, SDGs and other uh, indicators around the world. We have also created a modern end-to-end -end data repository. So we are creating a data hub to actually service this entire ecosystem right from data generation in countries to sort of its storage, its documentation, analysis, dissemination, and use across all our regions and countries. Can I have the next slide, please? So here you see sort of a snapshot of, uh, you know, what do we know about the status of 
health data systems and capacity. And as you see, in almost every single one of these areas, there are gaps. So I think the, the purpose of this exercise today, I think, is to see how can routine health information systems supported through platforms like the DHIS2 working in countries actually fill some of these uh, critical data gaps uh, that we have. Because of course, you know, as the saying goes, what we don't measure, we don't manage, what we don't manage, we don't change. So can I have the next slide, please? So essentially, I mean, countries really lack a significant capacity uh, in all these areas to monitor uh, their health system performance. And as you can see here, whether it is to do with surveys, whether it's CRVS, what is health services data, or even looking at their own progress and performance or enabling its use, there remain significant uh, data gaps. Can I have the next slide, please? So our effort here is really addressing data gaps through capacity building, aligning our resources in countries, improving the access to this data as public goods, and make it easy for this data to be findable, accessible, usable, and support a data exchange through a standard uh, reporting and collection platform such that we truly believe uh, in the axiom of not leaving anybody behind and providing appropriately disaggregated data to target uh, action. And of course, all this in engagement with civil society and of course, all stakeholders at the end of the day. And what we need to do also is to increase the ownership and sustainability of data systems and of of course, make ourselves more accountable so that whatever services are being delivered are more appropriate and responsive uh, to the needs of the people we serve. Can I have the next slide, please? So what have we been doing with regard to routine health information systems component of data that comes from health facilities? WHO working with partners like the University of Oslo has been setting along with its technical programs, the normative standards and guidance. We have been working very closely with the University of Oslo in developing the DHIS2 WHO digital packages running regional and country capacity strengthening exercises and piloting and scaling up use cases to generate the right evidence such that we can actually provide these data related public health goods that can drive action. Can I have the next slide please? So as all of you probably know, the University of Oslo and the HIS network is a WHO collaborating center for health information system strengthening and since uh, 2018. And it, we focus our collaboration, the development of DHIS2 as the digital tool to enable country implementation, building capacity on standards, quality and analysis and actually supporting countries in doing operational research and, best, and informing best practices such that we improve standards, promote country ownership of their own data systems. Can I have the next slide, please? So this has uh, been, as I, we just heard, uh, going on for a while. Uh, you know, our role from WHO is to develop uh, these standards and guidance while the University of Oslo and the HISP network actually produces the DHIS2 configuration design and use and supports uh, its implementation uh, in countries and supports countries in the sort of use of uh, the, not just the platform, but actually the use of the data across a range of different uh, health areas. At the next slide, please. So the idea really is for us to work together to develop this integrated approach 
uh, and the toolkit uh, for routine health information systems, right from standards and measurements to integrated analysis and providing programmatic guidance through these digital automated packages for facility data using the DHIS2 platform. Have the next slide, please. Uh, I don't need to go into the details of this, but as you know well, the DHIS2 uh, metadata packages that WHO has developed in partnership uh, are used in many, many places around the world. Uh, there are many countries that use this either as their national uh, health uh, management information system, or uh, there are many countries that pick parts of these uh, standard packages, including most recently for uh, COVID-19. And of course, all this also in many countries supported through an Android app. Next, next slide, please. So our ultimate goal, as I said, is to really use data to drive uh, the strengthening of data systems. So encourage countries to look at their data quality, make it accessible, look at the visualization of this data, assess their own situation, support the use of technology, and ultimately connecting uh, the country data with the globally agreed uh, health targets. And of course, as all of us know, you know there is an opportunity now with COVID-19 for us to actually ride this wave to strengthen uh, data systems everywhere. Have the next slide. So as I mentioned to you, we are building, uh, you know, the World Health uh, Data Platform and our data hub. So there is this single portal of entry now uh, uh, to WHO's data systems and its data assets where also we present all our flagship reports and tell our uh, data-related stories. Have the next slide. Uh, so we also have a dashboard uh, where we show progress towards uh, what we call our triple billion targets uh, to deliver a measurable impact. Have the next slide, please. And as I said, we produce our World Health Statistics on an annual basis. Get to the next slide. And there is also a weekly uh, data entry platform that we have developed uh, for COVID. Have the next slide. That's the last, that was the end yeah. of the slides. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I think it, it, so in conclusion, what I really want to state is, you know, our partnership uh, with the University of Oslo and all of you as part of the DHIS2 community is really to see how, you know, we can work together to actually create the seamless data flow from countries, whether it is at the district or some other subnational level or the national level, up to a global sort of reporting platform like WHO, such that we re reduce reporting burden on countries and work together to actually facilitate uh, the timely generation and use and dissemination of this data. Thank you very much. Thank you, Somnat. Uh, this was very, very, very interesting presentation. And uh, Elaine, you will then introduce Jörn for the next session, I guess. Yep. So, for the, um, mm. yep. for the next coming slides, we've got Professor Jörn Bra from um, the University of Oslo, who's been here since, I guess, the first stages within DHS2. And um, Jörn will introduce really as to why we need to start looking at this concept of designing for data use. So over to you, Jörn. Yeah, hi, 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 everybody. Okay. So uh, yeah, we can we can take a slide on uh, Elaine. <clears throat> so I will uh, give a, a brief uh, overview of of, of the motivation for why we have this designing for data use uh, uh, initiative. 
and it's uh, to a large extent based on work being carried out on this uh, subject and in uh, countries in East Africa and Indonesia and where we have uh, tried to put up uh, an approach for improving the data use in, uh, in at the district and, and facility levels in particular and also how to improve uh, the DHIS2 uh, uh, platform and its usability uh, to improve data use. So if, if you look at the, at the general approach we have followed, we have started with uh, uh, assessing the situation and suggest uh, improvements. So we identify cases for, for routine data use, uh, study practices, and we identify shortcomings, and we work with users uh, for together with them to suggest improvements. So the participation and the participatory design tradition is very, very important part of this. And if we look at the general findings from, from these different countries is that all countries have uh, routine districts and facility level data use and evaluation meetings. So they are using data. So we can say that at one hand, I mean, the, the, the use of data may be uh, and data from DHIS is maybe uh, better than uh, expected, but we also see that how actually the DHIS2 is uh, adapted to, to data use at the local level is maybe not as good as expected uh, because uh, dashboards tended to be generally configured and not really focusing on what are the needs for local level, uh, level uh, uh, data use. I mean, denominator data, target population, etc. are not easily available in, in uh, in uh, the DHIS uh, for, for the facility catchment areas. And many therefore use uh, Excel and the functionalities of the Excel instead of, of, of the database to put it that way. And for, for in that way, be, it's easier to include the data that you are missing like a catchment population for facilities, etc. So these are are, are uh, the topics we have been addressed. And uh, you see that if you look at what functionalities on the data output side in the HS that are most used, you see that it's the pivot table uh, that is used for downloading to, to Excel. And of course, uh, to use data, whether it's in Excel or wherever, it's, it's fine. But our point here is that in many cases, it's better to use a database for, for producing uh, the different analytics than having to even type in again things in Excel at, as is done by, by several, even though many are downloading. Next slide, please. So when we approached uh, the district health system, the facilities, etc., we we have a, a social system perspective, uh, we call it, and we we try to engage users in a participatory design approach. And by looking at uh, all the different, different areas of data use in a district and at the facility level, I mean, we see that actually there are many, many situations where data is handled and, 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 uh, and, and used. Uh, so in order to then work with the, with the users to identify some key areas, uh, we come up with some suggestions for improvement. And if you look at the next slide, we, we see that we started with some uh, low hanging fruits uh, because uh, what we see is that all countries have uh, these uh, routine data meetings or routine meetings where data is discussed and potentially used uh, at district level and at facility level. And in Rwanda, which is this particular case, we see that at the hospitals and the health centers, there are data validations each month, and there are staff meetings discussing the quality of, of the performance every month. And at districts, they get all the 
facilities together, representatives from all the facilities together, and have meetings every month. And what we were then uh, finding out together with, with uh, the participants was that there were many improvements that could be done uh, when it comes to the DHIS and, and analytics and dashboards, etc. So that is one way to, to focus on, on uh, designing for data use and to, to uh, engage users in, in, in the participatory uh, approach. And what we saw is uh, like we saw in more or less everywhere that the main problem is this catchment area, uh, target population for facilities. And when you want to have a, say, a, a district comparative dashboard looking at the performance and the coverage indicators in the different facilities, that's not really uh, possible because uh, boundaries for the catchment areas are difficult, difficult to to, uh, to 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 set, and you don't have have uh, uh, population uh, denominator data beyond the, the district in in the DHIS in this case. So that is the main problem that we need need to address. And yes, next slide, please. So in in the case of Rwanda, then we have established what we call a data use project where we have, uh, for example, with many, many different uh, approaches to, to have a dialogue and a conversation around how to improve uh, DHIS2 for data use and how to improve data use more generally. And we have an app WhatsApp group where uh, all, the, all the district uh, health uh, information uh, managers are uh, members. And with the lively lively uh, discussions uh, in three languages and uh, that's just one example of how how we can get through with various various uh, uh, conversations and and uh, identify requirements and work on improvements so many of the things the people wanted to to improve was to be able to to add colors, text, fix uh, legend formats, etc., in the DHS. Uh, on the one hand, all that's kind of uh, output issues, and also how can we get uh, more standardized uh, reporting so we don't have to start from scratch every every month for the monthly report, and more flexibility in in actually reusing uh, analytics. So many, many of these these uh, these issues are then then discussed with with uh, with also with the, with the core team uh, developers, and some will have to to be solved at the local level. So some requirements uh, will be uh, at the level of generic uh, app development, and some on custom app development. That's where we are actually experimenting a little now with with the Rwanda project. And we are working together with the, what we call the uh, design lab at the University of Oslo. Next slide, please. So if we take the more principal uh, analytical uh, perspective on, on uh, how to develop or how to involve local users in global development, we see that there in the case of, 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 of DHS2, because what is, I mean, actually part of the core DHS2, which is developed, uh, coordinated by the University of Oslo, that is, say, generic features that can be adapted to any context. But in order to come through with, with the local requirements, we have seen that uh, in order for say, say the, the project in, in Rwanda to come through with the, with the features that are not really good enough today in the generic uh, core, core software. To, to go through this uh, global development and engage with the, with, the, with the roadmap process to get it on the timeline and get it developed. I mean, then we're talking about one year from you, from you, from you come 
with your requirement to actually get 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 through with 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 some uh, some concrete uh, uh, development so so that is uh, too slow for for what we call mm. participatory design and more agile uh, development of 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 uh, lo locally uh, local applications so this is where we then say that we need to add this custom app development uh, approach as part of, of the of the general uh, process of developing the DHS2. And that is not new, but maybe to improve that one is, is uh, something that we, we should and are uh, working on. And that this is not new at all. For example, the dashboards you see, see uh, in a DHS2 today was first developed uh, as a kind of a hack in, in India and through specification of that requirements from there it was actually taken in as a generic app in in, in the, the dhs2 and a recent development in sri lanka for example we saw that in sri lanka last year during the initial uh, covid19 uh, work uh, they developed a custom uh, feature uh, which actually was uh, how to trace uh, I mean, how to, to visualize contact tracing uh, as a network so that you could follow uh, the cases and, and the contacts. And that uh, was very popular in, 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 uh, in uh, Rwanda. And say so that app development in, uh, sorry, in Sri Lanka, that uh, feature was then in collaboration with the, with the core team, uh, DHI's core team, developed as a generic feature and is now used in many countries for example in in, in uh, rwanda uh, you are two minutes is... or actually one minute so you need to wrap up otherwise the rest of the guys cannot talk <laughs> sorry you have one more slide yes i think so yep. yeah and then you finish okay explain change slide thanks yeah, now this is just a summary of, 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 of uh, challenges and specific uh, specific uh, uh, requirements that we have uh, identified, and many of them are linked to to the problem of, of uh, local uh, cover uh, local uh, local uh, uh, target populations and denominator data, and that will be discussed actually in the session in in uh, half an hour so uh, we can rather come back to it uh, at that point then and another 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 problem we have seen is that dashboards that everybody makes their own dashboard is not really the best uh, best approach they can do that but in addition to that we must have a way to distribute standardized uh, uh, best practices uh, dashboard yeah thanks for that okay bye bye thank you Jan. and then elaine will have a little bit of a conceptual uh, introduction to our project. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Jörn. And really what I'm just going to overview here is, you know, what do we want to achieve? And Jörn has covered quite a bit of this in terms of kind of starting on, you know, wh what we've done before, we're really looking at local needs situation and looking at local action, but we're looking at it from, from the whole spectrum of information systems, design, development, implementation, and use. Um, and the aim being to improve the use of routine and practice, but sharing also some of those innovations that Jörn has said across the different networks um, and across the different countries and informing the future design and development of DHIS2 globally, whilst also addressing the local situation. And it's about also further strengthening our network of action. Uh, so therefore, really, when we're talking about this, the, this concept, it's not new, but we're just looking at enhancing and developing data use in practice. And in terms of enhancing, I mean, you'll have heard quite a lot about um, DHIS2 and its roots right from the opening address around its activist foundation. You have heard of all of the stories around kind of countries and regions looking at local relevance and how that has had an amazing impact globally and sharing our lessons and experiences across countries. It's very much field based, but also evidence informed. So this is where our kind of history of action research comes in. 
and it's it's done within the framework of system strengthening and capacity development. So we're looking at, and you'll see in the examples that are going to come up, some of those broader um, systems issues that are addressed within our development and use of the data. And as you know, we've got an extensive network within countries and, glo and kind of globally, and we are looking at enhancing and developing capacity within that, but also expanding. But I think interestingly, we're looking at also developing across sectors, and you will see in the um, um, slides that are coming up of how we're actually managing to do this within the education sector. But there's other examples also of looking at it, say, for example, in food security um, and the agricultural sectors and others. And also we're looking at innovations and looking at, as Jörn has said in the slide, of making sure that the process is it's meeting the needs, the direct needs on the ground, whilst also over the longer term, looking at how we can share those. So this concept of um, designing for data use is really about a, a, a overall holistic approach to design. Um, it's going the last mile to local level use of data in practice. And it's going from the whole stage of analysis to being able to collect the data, process it, analyze it, present it, interpret it, and use it. So what I'm going to do here is rather than kind of speaking continuously conceptually around it, we're going to share, you know, different aspects of designing for data use. I'm going to go through a couple of examples of the developing the capacity in the design part of it. And then I'm going to hand over to our colleague from Uganda to give some examples of innovation and intersectoral use. So these, these examples I'm taking from our kind of our academies and our training. So the contributors are listed there. And um, there's many people working on these um, training material at local level, at regional level, um, and also our academies. And it really is to highlight, just give you a few examples of fundamentally, if you don't start looking at it from the kind of design, from the kind of maintenance, from the implementation, we end up with no data or no access to data, which fundamentally ends up with no use. So, for example, by highlighting implications of poor configuration and developing skills to configure correctly, we find that we will show that in configuration, this impacts not alone the users in terms of correcting, collecting the correct items so they can actually generate the data outputs they want, but it also will look at improved data quality and that will lead to improved use. And also it'll just make it much easier to administer the complete system. So, so we highlight issues from kind of configuring how that will impact our data use. We also, for another example would be in looking at setting up the forms. And this is particularly, um, um, it, it's a particular issue when we're looking at kind of various forms from kind of paper systems feeding into electronic systems um, and dealing with legacy systems. And it's about developing capacity to define, identify and implement kind of good form design whilst dealing with the reality of striving for the best practice or good practice principles, but dealing with the existing situation around um, the work practices there. It's about issues around disaggregation, having that so that we can actually look at issues around kind of gender, age, um, disability. It's about avoiding duplicate variables within forms, across forms, across programs. And so something as simple as designing your data entry form is approached from the aspect of, you know, how does this improve or support information use? And the last example is something that's often overlooked is around kind of both the maintenance and the governance of the system. So general maintenance around, you know, kind of upgrades to um, DHIS or to your system or your server. And we've seen in the opening um, plenaries of how, you know, we are advancing with the kind of analytics, advancing with the kind of functionality within DHIS too, but we need to make sure that we're supporting the general maintenance and those upgrades within country. We look at issues around organizational units configuration and the impact that that has on how you can use the data. 
And as Jörn mentioned, the next session is going to look at kind of um, denominator data, and we'll see how something like organizational unit configuration can impact that. Another issue is around who has access to the data, sharing the data, at what level you share the data, because we want to make sure data is used at all level and the right people have the right data and access to that. That relates to, as I said, the sharing of the data, and particularly as we're expanding the data ecosystem between various um, ministries, various NGOs, the implications of sharing data in terms of the ability to use it. And obviously, this is fundamentally based on data integrity and data quality and the need for data quality checks. So I've just run through an example of the, to kind of illustrate the concept of the, when we're saying designing for data use, that it goes right back to the assessments, but also in terms of developments, design and implementation. But I'm going to hand over to um, my colleague, Dr. Um, Dr. Prosper Behumbeze, who's leading our Uganda his team, to show you really where we have that cross-sectoral and the uh, innovations that really are, I think, pushing the boat out for us to go the last mile. So over to you, Prosper. Yeah, thank you very much, Elaine, and uh, the, the previous speakers for, for the introduction. Yeah, good morning and good afternoon to all our participants. Uh, thank you for joining us. So we're going to share a few of the innovations and some of the workarounds that we have done to promote data use uh, from the DHIS2. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Yes, yeah, so what we see is uh, DHIS2 has really done a great job in terms of getting data into the system. That is the, the, the data capture, both aggregate and the individual level with all the mobile and, and other devices that we can be able to put data into the system. So for Uganda, we, we looked at access as one of the ways to be able to promote data, data use. And, uh, and this is we cut across all countries. Of course, having the data and people are not able to access it becomes quite challenging uh, to, 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 to use. So one of the uh, initiatives that we, we saw at the beginning, we used at the beginning of the DHIS implementation uh, right in 2012, uh, was an initiative started by UNICEF Uganda in trying to promote zero rating, what you what we call accessing DHIS to um, uh, at zero bundles, uh, but this is prepaid. So UNICEF was able to work out with, with some of the networks to, to zero rate or white list um, the DHIS to uh, URL, which enabled many users to be able to use their dongles, phones, and be able to access uh, uh, data. And this over time has really promoted data uh, entry, but most importantly, the use, so that you know, the district, national, are able to get to the, the DHIS2 uh, um, at, at, at zero cost, while the cost is covered uh, centrally. So you see, you, we saw this over time. And again, uh, when we had the COVID um, uh, surveillance, uh, partners also came in and tried to zero rate. And again, also that improved uh, quite a lot in terms of access. So this is an initiative that can be uh, initiated by partners, but more importantly, if governments or ministries can come in and be able to uh, work with telecom companies to offer this kind of uh, corporate service to the community, it, is, it will be, leads to uh, access and improve the data use. Then again, also with support of UNICEF, um, we, with the introduction of DHIS to SMS reporting, SMS notifications for appointments in tracker, feedback, uh, surveillance notifications to different user groups. Uh, we saw uh, coming up with, a, again, a prepaid short code that uh, the health now uses for most of the reporting and most of the notifications, uh, TB, HIV, and, and also for surveillance, most important, when we, when we run our analytics and we're able to, uh, or to hit the threat, to, to compare the thresholds, we can send notifications. So this again is a, an SMS that has supported reporting uh, right from the lower communities, community health workers, districts, uh, to, to free the reports to DHIS2 and also for the tracker implementations, get this notification at no cost to the, to the beneficiary. In terms of feedback, again, for the surveillance also has really supported uh, data use uh, 
in this surveillance. Then at the beginning also of uh, our introduction of DHIS2 for education in Uganda, uh, and after looking at all the challenges we've had in health in terms of access again, we looked at an initiative to be able to have a prepaid um, shared connectivity uh, in the district headquarters. Originally it was planned to be used for the district health and education teams, but as we moved on in the implementation and with the lack of connectivity at most of the districts, we found this being shared across the different departments, even in some areas, including health, uh, coming also to share this kind of prepaid uh, wireless connectivity. As you can see in the corner here, you will see that that's a wire mesh, I mean, a, a wire mesh uh, internet connectivity that we can be able to use. And the team down there is visualizing their data uh, in the education sector, and again, also across the health. So these are some of the issues that have promoted access and in the, in the long run improved uh, data use. Next slide. So uh, again, uh, when you are looking at data, you, data use again, you try to see that uh, at least DHIS2 can provide a one-stop center for all the data. So as we've been implementing aggregate reporting for most of the programs, there has been a lot of need for granular data uh, collection. And with the use of the tracker in the DHIS2, we saw this as an avenue integrated already within the DHIS2 to be able to bring on board granular data for analysis. A picture you see in there is one of the oldest and the maybe first tracker implementation in HIV. You can see all and, and the last, mobile labs. Uh, this is where we started with the HIV tracking of, of pregnant women uh, through uh, birth and the postnatal of the children. So this allows us to be able to integrate this, this uh, tracker data with the DHIS2. And we've been able to do this using an in-house um, uh, data input with that, that uh, most of the countries actually have taken up. It's a generic app that you can be able to get from the app store and install. Uh, and this has allowed us to be able to easily integrate um, tracker aggregate data with the national aggregate data so that the data can also be analyzed in one in one place. So you'll see um, where we have been able to implement TB case surveillance we've been able to also integrate easily this tracker data with the, with the, the national DHIS2. We've also done this for the lab during COVID, integrating the lab results with the, the DHIS2. We've done this for open MRS HIV in Uganda. Again, through this app, which is a genetic app that uh, I encourage users to be able to get on and, and use to, to automatically aggregate data and send it to the DHIS2. We, we've also um, has seen this uh, really, really important, especially as many partners, many users want to bring the data. And so implementation of the tracker has also helped data use. Next slide. Uh, again, uh, we've seen um, a lot of demand to have visuals that can be able to uh, inform decision making at one stop. Yeah, the HIS2 has been great in terms of analytics, but when it comes to presentation, uh, we see that uh, different users, different people require different ways or styles of data presentation. And again, time-wise time and training-wise, you find the top management leadership may not want to dive deep into the pivot tables, the analytics to be able to, to support um, to, to, to do analysis. So we've been provided and developed uh, a, a, a generic tool, a smart display. I, people with teams have shared over the, over the week how they've used this smart display in COVID surveillance. So we've developed a smart display app that allows us to be able to project data on smart screens, as you can see in the picture. This is the command center for COVID, and you can have the items of the dashboard running uh, in a slide mode and uh, uh, as the meetings are going on, as people pass by the command center, they are able to, to visualize their data. And, and, and this, we've been able to take it even to the public places. As you can see, this is an education dashboard that is being displayed in a public Ministry of Education that, uh, you know, as people wait, they can be able to see statistics about around their data, and their, their districts and all that. And again, to further also improve use, which may not really uh, sound like this is real use, but it's also to promote 
the use of the data within the system. For example, we have been supporting COVID surveillance and their travel passes. We've come up with an app that can allow them and allow us to be able to uh, generate a travel pass that can be scanned QR code as, as travelers pass through uh, different stations. Uh, as we have also come to the vaccination, we've also been able to do, develop a, a vaccination car, a certificate, electronic uh, certificate that can be used to travel across the country. So um, real-time data use is one area that we have seen uh, that can be able to promote uh, data use. We did this in the measles and rubella campaign and um, uh, the ministers, the different players being able to see their data real time coming from the, from the district on a smart display really promoted the data use. Next and, slide, and last. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, we looked at also promoting data use and the, even the other in, in the innovation that we have around for promoting data use. We have the cross-sector um, data analysis and sharing that we have tried to start um, now for education and health. And, and this has helped a lot to be able to bring on board the education, uh, uh, pattern, uh, the education oh, minutes of education awesome. in terms of improving data use. So well, what you see here is the campaign I was talking about and how this is cross-sector cross work was that um, immunization for children happens in schools and for school to growing children. So once you have data from education to inform immunization in the, in the health, uh, in terms of your denominators, in terms of your immunization posts, this promotes data use across the sector. La the, the other piece that we are, we've been able to integrate has been the COVID surveillance using the school the surveillance. Uh, and last also for the vaccination, as you can see here, the circle point is looking at the teachers. So the teachers, data is coming from education, but who is immunized, is vaccinating, is coming is from health. So integrating these two systems and looking at this data has also promoted data use. I thank you very much. And over to you, Erin. Okay, that's um. Thank you very much. Um, well, I go on to the next um, presenters there, Kristen. Yes, please. Yes, yep. please. Thank yep. you so much, Prosper. This was exactly what we wanted to, to, to showcase innovative instruments and design for designing for data use. So, and I should say they can cross sectorally with the education and the kind of health sector being an example there. Okay, this is a really packed plenary, as Kristen had said um, at the beginning. So for the last um, few minutes, I just wanted to um, give the floor over to um, Paul Bondage and, Jen, um, and uh, Jennifer Shivers, who will look at the Open HIE sub-community on data use and just provide us with an overview of what they're doing. Uh, Elaine, we don't see yep. the slides anymore. Yep, I'm just putting, sorry, I just have to share. Good. And the next slide. So, oh, sorry, I was I was to give a plug for the upcoming sessions um, that we have, as you mentioned there, there was DHIS2 Design Lab and working and building on that. There'll be a session following that today at three. And then as Jörn said, um, use of data at facility level, solving the denominator problem, that session will follow today at two immediately after this. Okay, so sorry, um, over to you, Paul and Jennifer. And I think there is someone not muted. Uh, I tried to find out, but uh, I'm trying to unmute uh, Moise Malandel, but it's unmuting. So, okay, over, Paul. Well, hello, everyone. It's uh, nice to see so many familiar faces. It's been a long time since I've spoken with many of you, but um, it's good to have an opportunity to talk about this new community um, that we have established over the course of this past year in collaboration with multiple philanthropies, uh, including PEPFAR, the Global Fund, and the Gates Foundation. But if you could flip to the next slide. It's been really... It's been really nice to hear about all of the different examples of data use, but I'd like to also include another form of data use, which is at the direct 
a point of care delivery. Um, clinicians like myself are often making decisions around um, uh, specific things that need to be done for patients. And we can see this really clearly with the problem of uh, HIV viral suppression and uh, HIV treatment continuity. Oftentimes um, when we're taking care of patients with chronic diseases, um, uh, information needs at the point of service delivery are more important than ever. And we recognize that in order to truly achieve viral suppression, we need to find innovative ways to support the point of care delivery such that we're um, improving uh, people's long-term outcomes. And what we've realized is that um, there are lots of innovations within the field around HIV treatment continuity. Um, there's innovative uses of technology at the point of service delivery and above, um, but oftentimes um, all of those experiences that are happening for many years in the field are not necessarily organized in a way that can inform future best practices. Um, there are um, uh, not also not many consensus building opportunities around those best practices. They don't necessarily occur, occur organically. So people are so busy working and taking care of patients and doing the best they can to support service delivery um, that they don't even necessarily realize that these innovations might have broad use and under, uh, uh, value to those um, in other environments. And so we've established a community of practice to transform these real world uses of data experiences hopefully into agreed upon best practices by basically sharing them amongst each other and then supporting um, a synthesis of all of those field experiences into some recommendations as a community. So if you flip to the next slide, if I could just briefly summarize, you know, there are all kinds of ways in which uh, clinicians and health workers, including community healthcare workers, including uh, people working in clinics and in hospitals, they're all directly working with information when they're taking care of patients. And that, that process of figuring out how to use data um, directly at the point of service delivery, if you could flip to the next slide, all of those examples are almost kind of like pieces in a puzzle. The answers we believe are very much in the field. So if you flip to the next slide. So the data use community in brief um, empowers these field practitioners to provide guidance and recommendations to all of the rest of us who are learning from their experiences. We're, we're starting off with the concept of HIV treatment continuity, um, but ultimately this data use community will support other um, really hard health delivery problems such as uh, treatment continuity by bringing together implementers, subject matter experts, other key stakeholders to share all of these community best practices. Um, and we hope that over time, as that knowledge sharing occurs, we start to identify themes and that's what's already happening within the community. And we also hope that all of these field practitioners can essentially influence those that are supporting care delivery, such as aid agencies, philanthropies and other stakeholders. So if you flip to the next slide. The, the community work that we're doing uh, occurs at a few levels. And so at the lowest level, as I talked about, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of innovators out all throughout the world who are um, developing ways in which they're taking care of patients with data and information. And um, up to this point, we have over 600 community members that represent many, many countries. And we have these monthly meetings where um, we've heard from at least 16 country examples of um, novel uses of data, including systems that are based on DHIS2, but also other systems uh, as well. And in some cases, uh, bespoke systems that were developed to meet a very specific local need. And so we've been building that community at the lowest level, and um, we are um, in the process now of developing um, sharing and networking. So if you go on to the the data use community web presence, you'll see a lot of information um, from various um, implementers and you're starting to see some uh, peer learning that's occurring between them. But then ultimately at the top, we want to 
design the future together as the field experience picks up uh, conventions that are over and over again relevant to context we want to identify those and to document those as a community and hopefully that would influence the way in which um, the world of philanthropy and countries themselves um, uh, think about the uses of information and can maybe be hopefully positively influenced by it flip to the next slide so as you can see, there are a whole bunch of activities that we're doing as the data use community. Um, and it's everything from building out those best practices. Every month we have a meeting in where um, uh, different uh, practitioners are sharing experiences around different parts of the, the continuity treatment um, uh, spectrum. We've developed something called a working model, which describes the clinical touch points on which uh, people uh, interact with each other to provide care. And we've described uh, within each of those touch points, a number of interventions that occur across many countries. And so if you wanna take a look at that working model, you should come to our data use community. But as you can see over the medium term and long term, we're hoping that uh, common tools, common approaches uh, start to emerge from that field experience. So if you flip to the last slide, um, if you're interested in learning more about the data use community, we have an email address that you're welcome to send us a note to. Um, there's also a website, ohi.org slash duck. There's a place there where you can go and sign yourself up. There's a mailing list that you'll be automatically registered for. It gets very low volume, like one or two emails a month. And in that you can find out about community events. And so if you're, if you're working in a country and you're very interested in a problem like HIV treatment continuity, and you wanna see interesting presentations around the ways in which um, countries outside of yours are working practically um, at the point of service delivery and using information systems to uh, improve treatment continuity, I think you'll enjoy the presentations. They've been um, really educational to all of us um, on this community. And so I'm going to pause there um, if there are questions or comments, um, but I think we're up against our time. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Paul. And as you say, it, it's interesting to look at kind of data use at a different level. Um, so over to you, Kristen. I think it's, it's we've only got about two, three minutes left. Yeah, so thank you so much for all the presentation. This has been a very, very packed uh, session, but we wanted to give you a little bit of the, a snapshot of what we have been doing the last few years, but also involving our, our dear friend Paul and also Somnat from WHO, our very long-term collaborative uh, center and participation in, in joint work. Um, this uh, designing for data use is actually, we didn't have time to present it, but it's actually one of our big projects now at the UIO together with all the his groups where we actually address uh, data use in practice all the way from what Jörn was talking about, how to understand the actual use in practice and how can we support that actual use? And how can we overcome hurdles in the platform to design for, as um, Prosper have shown, showcased uh, innovative solutions in order to overcome and work around in order to support the data use. So I think this we, we were supposed to start to end a little bit before so people have time to go to the next sessions. We have several sessions today. Uh, that we are engaged in, that is the denominator or the local use um, uh, that's coming just now in one minute. And after that, there is a research session where uh, several of our PhD students actually talk about their research projects, uh, previous and current PhD students. So welcome. And of course, there are many others. I think Magnus also have a, um, the, um, the DHS2 Design Lab session today. So check it out. And thank you for coming. We have been a good crowd. Uh, 147 or something. So I think we ended here and we see each other in next session. Bye.